The Nationals' resolution is going to be resolved. NATO should strengthen its relationship with Ukraine in order to deter further Russian aggression. This is a very specific resolution, which could easily be two different topics that have been mashed together, both in ways that limit it down a little bit more. It could just say NATO should strengthen its relationship with Ukraine, or it could just say NATO should deter further Russian aggression. But putting t the two together means that Pro has no choice but to defend both the method and the goal, which limits how they can advocate it being done and limits why they can advocate doing it. So those two things certainly narrow the debate down to a couple core arguments we'll talk about in a little bit. A couple words that are going to matter are strengthen, what that means, what ways a military alliance can actually strengthen its relationship versus its members' relationship, the idea of its relationship with Ukraine versus with EU applicants at large or with former CIS at large, and what further Russian aggression actually means. Has there been aggression? Is aggression being used in the terminology of international law, or is aggression being used in the terms of being aggressive? So those are the big questions about the topic itself. Let's talk a little bit about the background of the topic. So Russia then and now is a big part of the topic. Russia was the core of the USSR, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, from 1945 until the 1990s, we had a Cold War going on in which the United States was the key player in NATO and the USSR was the key player in the Warsaw Pact, two alliance systems which basically created a bipolar world. The USSR ended up crumbling for mainly economic reasons, starting in the late 1980s. The Warsaw Pact no longer exists, however, NATO does. That said, without the Warsaw Pact existing, NATO's primary purpose doesn't exist either, so its purpose has either changed or gone obsolete, depending on which sources you believe. Ukraine itself was a part of the USSR since before World War II. Crimea was added into the Ukraine after World War II by Khrushchev in, I believe, 1955, but it was basically just one component of the USSR. It was a very important component because it was near Turkey, which was the closest edge of NATO bases and US missiles, so there was a huge amount of Soviet military presence and nuclear experimentation going on in Ukraine. Chernobyl was in Ukraine, even though we tend to associate it more with Russia. This also meant that when the USSR pulled out, there were many military bases still left there, and there was a large nuclear program that still had all the ingredients to be successful there. Ukraine chose to give up its nuclear program in exchange for security guarantees, the strength of which are certainly being tested right now. So let's talk about Ukraine in a little bit more detail. Ukraine's last election was this past winter. A pro-Russian candidate got elected, Yanukovych. Viktor Yanukovych had promised that he was going to bring the Ukraine closer to the EU, the European Union, and try to get it membership and try to get it preferential economic treatment and try and get it bailouts for the debt that it was in. Russia didn't like how close Ukraine was getting to the EU and put pressure on Yanukovych to back out, so he did. This started protests, which became riots, which became outright guerrilla warfare, as riot police shot hundreds of protesters and more protesters showed up and revolts happened, and the capital of Ukraine, Kiev, pretty much got trashed with portions being burned to the ground until eventually Yanukovych fled to Russia. He didn't formally give up power, but he did leave the country, and Ukraine currently has an interim government. The next election in Ukraine is scheduled for May 25th. So that's between now and the tournament. So we don't know what the government of Ukraine is going to be. That said, there are certainly multiple people trying to influence the elections, both fairly and unfairly, and fewer than half of Ukrainians believe that these elections 
will reflect what the voters actually say. That there is less than a 50% chance of free and fair elections. So regardless of who gets elected, how they get elected is also going to matter. The ouster of Yanukovych is considered to be either a democratic uprising or a coup, depending on who you ask. Russia claims that the EU or the US or NATO, it changes who, instigated the protests to force a less pro-Russia leader into power. On the other hand, many of Russia's geopolitical rivals are claiming the exact opposite. They're saying that those protests were, on a, were an organic uprising, but that at the same time, Russia instigated the reactions to them and is instigating the rebellions in eastern and northern Ukraine right now. Ukraine is split down the center by a river, but the real divide in the country is the northeast, closer to Russia, versus the southwest. The northeast is the part that is not quite an open rebellion in most places, but where most of the conflict is, and Russia has most of its designs on. And part of that's because it has most people who are both native Russian speakers and ethnically Russian. Ukraine is split into a lot of different ethnicities and a lot of different languages, but the two largest in each case are Ukrainian and Russian. Languages have a lot in common, but they are not the same. The ethnicities share a lot of common background, but are certainly willing to tell you that they are very different. This played out both in terms of who rejected the Yanukovych government and who rejected the interim coalition. In both cases, splitting fairly straightforward along ethnic and linguistic lines. This means that most conflict in Ukraine, with the exception of Crimea and with the exception of Odessa, is along the northeast border, along Russia. Slavyansk, in particular, is a country which has, sorry is a city which has been controlled by militants for the past several weeks and has repulsed or captured any attempts by Ukrainian special forces or police to take the town back over. Crimea is particularly important because. It had a Russian naval base that was on indefinite lease. Sevastopol is Russia's only way of getting into that sea, and from the Black Sea all the way to the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. The only warm water port facing that side of the world was very important to Russia. And in a way, you can see this is kind of analogous to the U.S.'s relationship with Cuba, but if Cuba was the only port the U.S. had along the Gulf of Mexico. It's a country that's very close, that they used to directly control, they then tried to indirectly take over and failed to do so, and that they have since tried to influence the government of both directly and indirectly, while at the same time imposing sanctions on it and trying to harm its economy. They do, however, have a naval base in it that is on indefinite lease, and that is their main way of projecting power into the surrounding area, so they feel that what happens in that country is their business. And again, this could be talking about Cuba and Guantanamo Bay, or it could be talking about Ukraine, Crimea, and Sevastopol. So Russia sees itself as a power similar to the U.S., and sees that it should be able to take similar steps to defend its interests. Another analogy might be, for instance, Haiti. When the deposed leader of a neighboring country comes into your country and requests support, and your parliament or your congress authorizes support, that is seen as a grounds for humanitarian intervention, both with the U.S. going into Haiti and with Russia going into Crimea. So again, Russia sees itself as a regional hegemon who should be able to act in any way that the U.S. acts, and will use those analogies in describing its stance in this situation. With that aside, the other thing to keep in mind is that Crimea was added to the Ukraine later on. Ukraine as a whole is a mix of a lot of different nearby cultures, but that's fairly common with everything between Russia and the Balkans. It does mean, however, that Crimea was more pro-Russian than the rest of Ukraine, not by a whole lot, but that division certainly widened and stratified as a result of Russia taking over, that caused a lot of nationalistic sentiment in the rest of Ukraine, even though there are some militias 
holding some towns and clashing with some Ukrainian police and military. The situation in Ukraine is not civil war yet, but it certainly could become so between now and when you discuss this topic. The other thing to keep in mind is the military presence within and around both Ukraine and Crimea. Russia has a pretty big military, but more than half of it is tied up other places around Russia's borders. The ones who are free to come near the border, however, have done so. They've had journalists from Russian state-controlled media embedded with them who have been told that they are there to cover the conflict in Ukraine, which only makes sense if those military units are planning to go into Ukraine. And they have a lot more people than the entire Ukrainian army, a lot more tanks, a lot more aircraft, so on and so forth. Again, Ukraine doesn't really rely on military power so much as it relies on alliances and promises for its na national security. It figures that nobody else other than Russia is going to mess with it because it's so close to Russia, but also that Russia isn't going to because of its closeness to the EU, to the US, and to NATO. Those assumptions are certainly being tested and will continue to be tested over the next couple months. Russia could easily put 200, 300,000 troops in Ukraine on a couple weeks' notice. They've been massing near the border since the Sochi Olympics. Ukraine does have a military of its own, but wouldn't be able to fight Russia directly. This topic really isn't about who would win if the two countries fought. It is about deterring the situation from becoming more aggressive and what the best way to defuse it is. The other thing to keep in mind is that Russia formally only has military in Crimea, and officially they only came in there after the situation completely stabilized, after the Russian parliament authorized force, and after Yanukovych asked for help and Crimea asked to be included in Russia. In practice, a lot of the concerned citizens, as Russia calls them, in northeast Ukraine and in Crimea are Spetsnaz, are Russian special forces. They've taken the flags off their uniforms, but they're using weapons and tactics that nobody else has access to in that region, or in some of the weapons case, in the world. The riots in Ukraine originally had a lot of people armed with crowbars, shotguns, and hunting rifles. The three Ukrainian aircraft that have been shot down by rebels in the northeast were shot down with weapons that only Russia has access to. So it's an open secret that there are Russian special forces in Ukraine. Whether that counts as Russian aggression is a question to be decided in the round, but generally speaking, it's going to tend toward yes. Because a very literal interpretation of aggression that says it only means the war crime and it only means when sanctioned by the state, if you're going to be that literal about it, then yes, it is further Russian aggression, because Russian aggression happened to Ukraine in the early 20th century. So, either way, I don't think that literal reading is going to get teams out of arguments, but teams should be prepared for the argument that Russia isn't actually being aggressive in Ukraine right now, just so they don't lose to it because they weren't expecting it. So, where does NATO come into all of this? NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It was founded in 1949. West Germany joined it in 1955, along with a few other countries. Spain joined it in 1982. And then it pretty much stayed as is until the end of the Cold War. In the early 1990s, NATO was exactly the same as it was when Spain joined. By the year 2000, NATO had expanded. It had taken a few countries in 1999, or a few more had planned to a bit in 2004, but these countries were all steadily moving westward. They were former Soviet republics, they were Eastern European countries that used to be part of the USSR. These countries are important because Russia formerly had them in the Warsaw Pact, and felt like NATO was trying to win the Cold War after it had ended to encircle them and to finish the job once and for all. Many Russian security analysts have seen NATO as an existential threat, and many ones who have for years are in positions of more prominence now. A lot of analysts 
say that Putin is very much in a Cold War mindset. He came to power through his career in the KGB, the Russian equivalent of the CIA, and he certainly has prided himself on being a structural realist, on respecting strength and exploiting weakness, on treating every country as an enemy unless it proves that it has something that he wants. He's also cultivated an image with the Russian people of ruling by strength, of being a stronger, manlier, more direct, more controlling ruler than ones they've had in the past, who were soft and weak and effeminate like Western leaders in the Europe and the U.S., and that image relies on him continuing to have an aggressive, hawkish foreign policy, which also helps to distract from the fact that the state of the Russian economy at home is basically that of a gas station that has gone into too much debt to keep operating, which is only compounded by the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia as a result of recent developments with Ukraine. That means that Putin has made a gamble that Russia's economy is less important to it, at least in the short term, than Russia's respect internationally, Russia being taken seriously both as a threat and as a power. Russia really started reacting negatively to the NATO expansion in the early 2000s, 2004 through 2008 actually, when NATO started making overtures towards CIS countries. And CIS is the Council of Independent States, a group that formerly belonged to the USSR. Ukraine was one of the founding members, but doesn't really associate with the CIS, because the CIS sees Russia as its leader, but Ukraine said that Russia wasn't the sole spiritual successor to the USSR. There's the reason that they should be the head of this. It should be a group of equal countries because they were all former USSR and not another means for Russia to continue indirectly controlling the countries it used to directly control. So that's the background for the topic. In part two, I'm going to talk about what questions you need to ask about the topic and how those questions shape arguments. 